During the summer of 1990, peace in Kuwait was shattered by the expansionist plans of their neighbor, Iran. On August 2nd, Saddam Hussein sent 100,000 troops across the border, announcing that Kuwait had ceased to exist. And my country is under occupation. My people are suffering. And I appeal to you again for your assistance and help. This will not stand. This will not stand, this aggression against Kuwait. When sanctions and negotiations failed, the United States led a 32-nation coalition against Iraq in Operation Desert Storm. Force will be used suddenly, massively, and decisively. Six weeks, Iraq's occupation forces collapsed. In a final act of vengeance, Saddam ordered the detonation of almost 700 oil wells. War leaves Kuwait devastated. Its people scattered, the whole network of modern facilities in ruins. Emergencies in every sector of society demand response. even for disaster, but who could have prepared for this? Six days after liberation, a small group of firefighters arrived to assess the task ahead. barrels a day going up in clouds of poisonous smoke and soot. If left alone, the fires could burn for a hundred years. It's not just darkness as you imagine darkness. And there were lots of days for a long, long time that were absolutely black. Everywhere you looked, there was a burning well. Everywhere you looked was nothing but destruction. And when you could see the sky, it didn't last but a few minutes, and it'd be total darkness again. to expect and then I told them there's no such words that I know that will explain what you're fixing to go into and I couldn't describe it to them what I'd seen I could not there wasn't words there's no words around to describe what we saw when we came here in March
Thousands of Iraqi mines and coalition bombs lie unexploded in the soft sand around the wells. Disposal teams creep through the dark days, searching them out. There's only a handful of oil field firefighters in the world, and no one is certain how long it might take. Some say five years, some say ten. Let's get this piece of junk out of here so we're going to work. From 40 countries come 10,000 people and thousands of tons of machinery. It's the largest non-military mobilization in history. the beginning, rebuilding the roads. On the edge of the oil field, there's a big deposit of a clay called gadge. Fine and dense, it will sit on top of the oily sludge without absorbing it. Thousands of tons of gadge build hundreds of miles of roads, one to every fire. Pipelines, useless now, stretch from every well and field to the coast. Why not reverse them? Instead of taking oil to the coast, bring an ocean of water to the middle of a desert. Saddam Hussein built this pipeline to flood the shore with oil and create a wall of fire against a coalition invasion. Now it too carries water to dozens of reservoirs and fills them with a million gallons each. of the wind is the key to the assault on the fires. With the wind pushing the heat away, bulldozers can move water pipes and monitor sheds to within nozzle range of the fire. Upwind of the 2,000 degree heat is a matter of life and death. But even here, you'll sweat a quart an hour, and 12 hours is an average day. When the water lines are ready, the team will cool the superheated ground between them and the fire they've nicknamed Rita. The firefighter's toolbox stands by with eight heavy equipment operators to support the four professional firefighters who make up the core of each team. Good morning. 
morning. I got some good news for you. Old Lebo and Angie had a baby boy. All right. Yeah, all right. Give it another firefighter. I mean to tell you. Looks like you got everything right here. The dirt work, the water. You gonna dig with your backhoe? I think it's work on the back side. We've got a drain cut, but we're gonna work on it a little more. And uh, we're gonna work on some of those big coke pile in the back on the rake. Okay. Well, I'm gonna get out here as hot as it is and go check on Paul. All I'll right. be back in a little while. Okay, Joe. Okay, biggin. The attack begins with a barrel of C4 plastic explosive. Unburned oil is solidified, building up a hard cap of coke over the wellhead. The C4 will blast it apart. If people would just think of explosives as an expedient tool, does a lot of work, it has a lot of energy in it, and it's instantaneous. So, and, and it's pretty safe. Uh, I've never had an accident in 35 years. Of course, we're violating uh, every safety regulation ever written when we uh, use explosives in the fire, you know, and uh, the heat and everything, but it's just one of those things that, uh, another way to do it. constant stream of water keeps men from collapsing and machines from melting. Everything that might reignite and extinguish fire must be pulled away. Only when you've completely cleared the ground around the exposed wellhead can you decide how to attack the fire itself. Every fire has its own personality and requires its own approach. This fire won't stay out. Time for the stinger. Its hollow steel spike is forced down the throat of the well. Then heavy mud is pumped in to choke off the oil supply. Simplicity makes the stinger a favorite technique, but it's only one of many. At George Hill's fire, the heat is so intense that the men can't work near it. A hollow steel venturi tube will lift the flame up and away from the men and machines. If it's a 30-foot tube, it'll roughly move your uh, radiant heat circle back 50 to 70 feet. I mean, it creates a low pressure at the base of that tube. It's unbelievable. I mean, it, it'll take your gloves off your hand. You've got to be careful where to suck your heart out. George has decided on an exacting technique. He'll try putting out the fire by maneuvering the Venturi tube. If you've got a real hard crosswind, it works better. We tried it on this one uh, twice yesterday, and we never could get it to work. This morning would be a good time to try it. Soak the oil at the top of the tube, forcing the flame downwind. 
Water aimed at the base is sucked up with the oil, reducing its flammability. Tilting the tube can separate fuel from flame for a split second. Now is the time of greatest danger. A steady downpour of oil turns the whole area into a huge torch, waiting for a match. The reignition of that fire, when you're not prepared for it, is probably the most difficult thing to deal with. It comes so fast, uh, you don't have any warning. Personnel are very likely to just go up just as quick as that well does. Flames engulfed a Romanian team in a situation like this. Natural gas had built up around them when the well flashed. At this wellhead, a diverter tube draws the gas away. Like oil-soaked shorebirds, human beings can overheat when their pores are clogged. You can pass out without warning. You're trusting your life to the men around you. But when the wind dies and the site fills with oil and gas, all you can do is pull back and wait until the weather improves. Today, I saw the sunrise for the first time. We took pictures, and it's the first time any of us had seen the sun since before this started. October, teams from the Soviet Union, China, and Iran join in the effort. French and British crews will bring the total to 27 teams. The pace of the battle has everyone improvising. Foamy One is a Canadian idea, conceived and constructed in two short weeks. It sweeps the vast ground fires of the world's second largest oil field, the Bergan Complex. The Hungarians recycled a Russian T-34 tank to create a spectacular prototype called Big Wind. They took off the gun turret and replaced it with jet engines from MiG-21 fighter planes. Water is injected into the jet stream. Then they just open the throttles and blow the fire out. Every team in this fight brings its own special strength. For the Kuwaitis, it is an intimate knowledge of the reservoirs beneath the sprawling Bergan complex. Petroleum engineers Asa Boyabis and Sarah Akbar started the Kuwaiti team. We had a very big motive during this uh, occupation to protect our country. Everybody was uh, trying to do his best. 
And we proved that we could uh, do a lot of things. I mean, uh, it was a process like uh, survival to us. Huh? Either we fight and become uh, uh, the owners of our land, or uh, we might as well die. Camping the wells around it has built up the pressure in this fire. Now it's the largest in the country, and a high gas content is causing almost complete combustion of the oil, making it the hottest. This is the crest of Borgan. This is the top part of the reservoir. This is the cream of Borgan actually being burned here. supply is gone just to cool the site enough to get close. Then the Venturi tube lifts the fire almost out of hose range. Just as success seems possible, the wind shifts, driving the heat back onto the crew. vaporizes on the superheated ground, and the team must fight its way back through boiling clouds of steam. They'll refill the reservoir build a second one, and move in again. This time, the plan calls for doubling the water. Oil won't burn unless it's hot. So enough water just might cool it to a point where the fire will go out. things special about the oil field. Everybody helps. Everybody tries to find a solution to the problem. They are here for the same purpose, putting off all these fires and uh, clearing the sky. Yeah, wait a minute. Let's put a, uh, let's put a box on the bottom. Texans have been dynamiting oil well fires for over 50 years. We have to get the well in a certain condition before we can use the dynamite. If you fire it remotely after you set up your charges and everything, you go away from the, uh, the detonation itself. And it creates a vacuum and the uh, fire doesn't have any oxygen to burn on for microseconds. Therefore, it starves and it doesn't have anything to uh, rekindle it. Watch the blaze, it's gonna jump. High torque cuts through steel wellheads with a high pressure stream of water and guarded dust. It saved days on each well capping. Wellheads used to be sawed off by steel cable stretched between two bulldozers.
Once the bolts are cut, the old well head is removed, and the capping assembly can be forced down over the oil flow in a process called snubbing. Air pressure from this accumulator will drive the valves so the well can be shut off remotely. It's still hard to comprehend, and I thought I had myself mentally prepared for what I was fixing to see. And you can't look at the countryside. You can't look at the destruction and the devastation and the senseless ruination of the, of the country. You have to look at them on a one-well basis. It's really a little bit more. It's more of the environment, too. I mean, because it's a global thing. But you're actually helping wildlife, you know, the seas, everything. It feels better. It makes you think about it, appreciate it that it doesn't happen like this all the time. As the smoke clears, the extent of the damage is revealed. The whole desert ecosystem is smothered under a blanket of tar for hundreds of square miles. Oases, once havens for desert wildlife, now lie under lakes of oil. Sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, trace metals, unburned hydrocarbons, and salt combine with the oil to encrust the tree. Thousands of migrating birds, the journey ended here. And for the human population, the prospect of poison air, polluted water, and the deadly legacy of war. Mines are designed to hurt people, that's the be all and end all. Uh, and if there are still mines on the beaches and people walk on them, somebody is going to get hurt. The desert was very safe for everybody to go. And we used to enjoy it tremendously. We can't do that anymore because the environment is completely disturbed. The natural pleasures we used to get from our land, we can't get anymore. The pain of the past is truly wasted if we learn nothing from it. People from around the world responded to this environmental assault with determination and unity. What experts feared might take years has been accomplished in just nine months. The 
Kuwaiti team will be turning from firefighting to the process of reclaiming the oil fields. You call George? Yes, yes, I call George, and he should be on the way with the two packer. It's not what you lose on surface, it's what you lose underground now. And that is a tremendous amount. Each and every one is like a patient that you know very well, like a human. We deal with them when they have a problem, and we try to solve that problem. The work will not stop. Our ultimate goal is try to recover all the wells. I know that we can do it. This rebuilding process is a real challenge. This is the first time I work in such a team. I know now, teamwork is the best way to go about things. There is no limits to what a human being can do. If the fear inside you is not there anymore, humans are put on this earth not to fight. You know, people could join forces to uh, build. And I think that's what uh, all people have learned uh, all over the world. 